Come on, say shake it off. Shake it off. We are in the last week of this bad blood <laughs> series. Oh my gosh. <sighs> I don't even know how to follow that up. Come on, say shake it off. Shake it off. Ooh, I'll shake that off. Okay, uh, how many of you have somebody at work that reminds you of that video? May I see your hands? Or school, like, so like somebody that like you wish you could uh, just send them all kinds of text messages, but they wouldn't be as nice as the ones that were in that video. <laughs> yes, I think a lot of us have people in our lives, difficult people we're trying to deal with. Um, and it kind of, like we're, we're gonna talk today about the practical ways in which we can deal with people that we have no choice but to work with or to see at school, or maybe they are part of our family. And we have to say, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna interact with these people that we cannot get away from? We can't, like, what do we do now? And I got to thinking, um, it's, uh, it's kind of like dealing with snakes. Who hates snakes? May I see your hands? Look at how many hands are up. Okay, now how many of you have ever been bit by a snake? Put your hand up if you've been bit by a snake. Be on, be on, like, look, look around. There's like 500 of you that are scared of snakes and like three of you have ever been bit by one. Like there's something about snakes that just kind of freak us out. And I, got, I was studying the scriptures uh, for this talk and I came across uh, Acts and there's a story in the book of Acts where the apostle Paul, uh, preacher Paul, gets uh, stranded on an island and he's gathering up a bunch of sticks in order to take over to a fire to make sure he's doing okay. And he's, he's holding all this, this big bundle of sticks and he, what he doesn't realize is there's a viper in the sticks. And all of a sudden it just comes out and latches onto his arm. And it's poisonous. I mean, it's It's a bad deal. Everybody around is like, ah, oh my gosh. And they actually say in the text, they say, he must have been a bad guy for God to punish him this way. We're gonna see what happens to him. Um, And then you get to how Paul responds to being bit by a snake. This is Acts 28, verse five. It says this, but Paul did what? What'd he do? Come on, say shake it off. off. He shook off the snake into the fire and he was... Unharmed. In fact, the passage goes on to say the people like waited around to see if he was going to die, if he was going to get hurt. Nothing happened to him. And they were like, man, there must be something special about this guy. Which leads me to the principle I want to talk about today. Last week of this uh, dealing with difficult people. And I want you to write it down. This is, here's the principle we're going to talk about tonight. Don't let the venom of poisonous people infect your soul. Shake it off. Don't let the ven- venom whoosh, of poisonous people infect your soul, you gotta learn to shake it off. In fact, this is the kind of the way I would love to say it. Like, like, there's a lot of people in our world that love to drink Haterade. Oh man, they just love the Haterade. They get so much joy out of, mm, slurp a little Haterade, makes them feel better about themselves if they can cut you down. Mm, mm, oh, mm. I feel so good about me if I can Talk about you and how stupid you are and how, what a jerk you are and how screwed up you are. And the reality is this. If people drink Haterade and you listen to it, it will always affect your ability to succeed in life. You have to figure out a way to ignore the haters and shake it off. Come on, say shake it off. Shake it off. Um, think about like, uh, somebody in, in sports for a second. Like we think about a guy who's playing in the NFL. Guys in the NFL have to learn to tune out all the people that cannot play because they suck, they criticize. You got 50,000 fans all in a stadium booing one guy. They're criticizing him because they don't get to play on the field, partly. So all I can do, all the only power I have is to criticize the guy on the field. But here's the reality. If you're ever gonna accomplish anything good in life, you're gonna have to deal with your haters. Only people... Only people who do nothing don't get criticized. But anybody who decides I'm gonna do something awesome, uh, one of the ways my pastor loves to say it is he says, if you're gonna do something great, people are gonna hate. If you're gonna do something great, people are gonna hate. But if you decide, I don't wanna make a difference, I don't wanna like, move forward, I don't really wanna succeed, because like, that, that way, oh man, you won't get criticized at all. But the second you decide to take a stand for something, the second you decide to move forward in your life, the second you decide, this is what I'm gonna seek to accomplish, there will always be people in the family There'll be people in your workplace, people in your school, who are gonna be like, I can't believe her. I can't believe she would think that she could. 
There'll be somebody who's standing behind you saying they're never going to succeed. It's never going to work out. And they'll always be critical. And you have to learn to shake off the venom in order to succeed. Does that make sense? Come on, say shake it off. This was Taylor Swift's response when uh, another individual who I won't name took her award spotlight and said somebody else deserved the award. You guys know the deal. So she wrote Shake It Off in response. She's like, you're just going to shake that off. I'm just going to move forward with my life. I'm still going to accomplish what I want to do. Do you know that the great theologian T. Swizzle was just repeating Jesus? <laughs> For real. Like, what you don't know is that when she writes Shake It Off, she's just writing what Jesus has already talked to his followers about and how to deal with difficult people. In fact, I want you to write the statement down in terms of, uh, of faith, and then we'll, we'll give you the verse. This is this. If you choose to follow Christ, some people will drink haterade and reject you. You gotta shake it off. Come on, say shake it off. There's always gonna be some people who can drink haterade. Okay, so just by raise of hands, we're gonna, we did this last night, we'll do it this morning too. Like, how many of you, if you are a believer, have had somebody reject you, mock you, or criticize you because you're a follower of Christ? Put your hand up in the air. Put them up, leave them up, look around, look around. That's almost all of us. The second you decide, I'm going to walk with Jesus, we are in a spiritual battle. Jesus is on the side of good. If as soon as you say, I'm going to align myself with something positive, immediately there's going to be people who go, you don't want to do that, you don't want to act that way, you don't want to, and they will immediately try to wreck you from following Christ. And Jesus says this is normal, that you should expect there will be people who are going to slurp the haterade if you decide to follow him. And here's how he says to respond to it. This is, this is the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 14. It says this, if any household or town refuses to welcome you or listen to your message, what's the next three words? What's those words? Shake its dust, shake its dust from your feet as you leave. Come on, say shake it off. That basically, he's saying this to the disciples. I'm going to send you out into towns. Some towns are going to reject you. If they reject you or criticize you, literally, just shake the dust off your feet. Now, the, what he means by that is this. Like in, in, this cult, in, in East Middle Eastern culture at the time, they believed that your feet is what collected the, the, the dirt and the sins of a city, which is why wherever they went, they always washing feet. So he would say, if the town rejects you, shake the sins back on them. Leave them to their own fate. In fact, look at the verse. He says, shake the dust from your feet as you what? As you leave. In other words, stop trying to reach the same person who's rejected you. Go find somebody else. Think about a fisherman for a second. Fisherman uh, wants to catch fish, and so he... He goes to the same spot at the edge of the lake every week, throws out the, the bait, sits there on the shoreline, waits for a fish, never catches a fish. Next week, same spot. 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 Same spot. Is he stupid? Yes, if he don't catch no freaking fish, he's stupid. He needs to move to a new space in order to catch what? fish. In the same way, what happens to us sometimes is people will reject us and we hear, oh, I want to help them meet Jesus. I want to help them meet Jesus. And we keep going back to the same spot and the same spot and the same spot and the same spot. At some point, you need to leave the spot and go find somebody new. That God's calling on your life is not to just be faithful, but it's to be effective. Come on, say effective. Effective means that God wants you to actually make a difference in the world, and in order to make a difference, sometimes you have to shake off a relationship. Sometimes you have to shake off the person that you're constantly interacting with, that you're just not making any progress with, and go, you know what? God can take care of them better than me. By the way, you're not God. God is God. God's good at taking care of people if you just leave them to God. And if you'll go look where God is already working, you'll be able to help somebody else because you shook off the one that doesn't really that you're not making any progress with. Does that make a sense? Yeah. Come on, say, shake it off. Yeah. Now, the challenge we get into is how do I do that? How do I, how do I shake this 
off? How do I move past this? How do I go beyond this? How do I, how do I shake off a relationship? When do I know when it's right to shake the relationship off? How, like, how does that, act, that, that dynamic actually work? I'm gonna give you four simple steps and then we're gonna let you ask some questions. Step number one, remind yourself of what God says about you. Remind yourself what God says about you. Now, uh, lots of people are gonna drink haterade and say you're stupid, you're not gonna amount to much, that you're a moron, that you're an idiot, that you're corrupt, that you're this, you're that. They're gonna say all kind of stuff about you, but what does God say about you? Does he call you a moron? He's like, I'm up in heaven, look down at my children, you guys all suck. Is that God? No. God's up in heaven looking at you and going, you, and going, you are approved, you're righteous, Oh, you're deeply loved, highly favored. That's why we say this every week, greatly blessed, totally right. We say that every single week because we have to learn to ignore what people say and know what God says about us. Basically, in your life, you're gonna believe God's voice is big and people's voice is small and you can succeed. God's gonna say you're loved and, and valuable and righteous and holy and you got, I got a great plan for you. Or you're gonna believe that people's voices are big and God's voice is small, and you will constantly care what everybody thinks all the time. It will always stress you out. You'll be so stressed and so worried that you'll never accomplish anything because you're always listening to voices that you think are bigger than God, which tells you what you really worship. You worship people, not God. At some point, you have to decide, do I worship God? Do I trust what he says over what man says? You know, there's a verse in the book of Proverbs. I didn't use this last night, but I thought this would be fun. Um, there's a verse in the book of Proverbs that says that if you fear man, it is like a hook in the nose. Because those people will, they'll drag you around every which way. They'll, they'll, they'll pull you off of your mission, off of what God's called you to do. And you can't focus on anything because you're so sidetracked by what some small person said about you. Imagine driving a car and there's a gnat. And it just keeps buzzing around your head and buzzing around your head and buzzing around your head. If you get distracted by the gnat, you're likely to get in what? An accident. If you keep your eyes on the road, keep your eyes on the calling. Come on, come on, say, remember what God says about you. Like uh, there's this, this the, the, the way in which that an army used to attack a city back in, back in the day. They would, like remember the, the cities in the old days had, had, had big walls around them. They would sneak up to a city and their goal was not to conquer the walls. Their goal was to pollute the well. So before they ever attacked the town, they would send in people under cover of darkness to poison the well because if the well got poisoned, the city would fall. Now, if that failed, then they would actually attack the city walls. But rather than just attack the walls, what they would do is they would lob rocks over the wall and try to hit the well and destroy it so once again there was no water for the people. This uh, group of soldiers were called slingers. It was their job to get slingshots and just keep lobbing rocks all day at where they knew the well was until the well was destroyed and there was no way for the people to get water. In the same way, Satan always attacks people the same way. He always tries to pollute your soul. He always tries to attack your well. If he can get you off your game, if he can get you to like listen to criticism and to pay attention to critique and to constantly worry about what everybody else says about you, you will poison your own well and you will never accomplish what God wants you to do. Come on, say protect your well. The only way you protect the well is the word of God. That you remind yourself, this is what God says about me. 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 And God's word over me is so much bigger than what man says about me. This is how you shake it off. Come on, say shake it off. Shake it Number two, remind yourself of your mission. Remind yourself of your mission. Now, the mission that we say around here a lot is uh, we exist, help as many people as we can cross the line of faith in. Is that your mission? Yeah. Come on, I would just say this. Uh, a lot of believers, I'm just gonna throw this out there. A lot of believers think their personal mission is more important than God's mission. 
and they worship themselves again rather than Jesus. That our primary calling as a believer is to help as many people as we can cross the line of faith and? And what? And follow Jesus. I would say, suggest that maybe the reason why you care so much about what people say rather than what God says is because you're not on God's mission at all. You're on yours. Because when you're on God's mission, you're listening to his voice and his counsel, and you're focused on, on passionately serving him. So everything else becomes a little bit irrelevant to you because you're so focused on helping as many people as you can cross the line of faith and follow Jesus. Come on, say, focus on the mission. Now, the mission, the mission isn't easy. I mean, it's not easy. Look, raise your hand. How many of you had people criticize you being Christian? Yeah, like, well, this is what Jesus says your mission is. Like, like I'm just gonna throw it out there. This is, this is like in the same passage where he says, shake it off. A couple of verses earlier, here's what he says. This is, math, this is Matthew 10, 16. He says, look, I'm sending you out as sheep among kittens. I'm sending you out as sheep among lollipops. Sheep among what? Sheep among wolves. That his mission for your life was to drop you behind enemy lines. That you were gonna be the one that was gonna get sent behind enemy lines into hostile territory and defend the kingdom of Christ and move it forward. Nobody ever said that was easy. And when you get shocked, oh my gosh, I can't believe somebody criticized me or somebody came against me because I love Jesus. Like, it's because you forget that you're behind enemy lines. You're a sheep who was placed in hostile territory. Now, some of you are thinking this, and this is what you're thinking, like, yeah, but if you're really, really nice to people and if you're just really, really kind and gracious and, and you give people grace, they'll always be kind and gracious back. Well, let's just see how this worked for Jesus. This is Luke chapter four. Um, Luke chapter four said, this is Jesus, and he's in, his, he's in his hometown, he's in Nazareth, and he's preaching. And here's what he preaches. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he's anointed me to bring, what? To the poor. Is that a good thing? Yeah, it seems positive. And he sent me to proclaim that captives will be released. Good thing? Yeah, uh, that the blind will see, good thing? Yes. That the oppressed will be set free. Yes. And that the time of the Lord's favor has come, good or bad? Good. Notice he's saying, I wanna do this for you, and I wanna do this for you, I wanna be this good to you, I wanna be this, I got, God, God's got so much favor for you, he is for you, not against you, he's got a plan and a purpose. Do you know what their response was, the next few verses? And they took him out to a hill to throw him off a cliff. I've been to the cliff. Drug him outside of town, and we're going to chuck him off a cliff for saying God is for you, not against you. We're saying God's got a plan and a purpose, and God wants to heal you and help you. I want you to understand that there is a real war between good and evil, and if you decide to stand with good and say God has a plan, God has a purpose, God wants to be good to you, you're going to have to deal with the fact there are wolves who will always come against you. Now, for those of you that are like kicking the tires of faith, you're kind of like right now, you're going, you're going, well, that's not a really good reason to be a Christian. Well, that would seem to be a good reason to be a Christian because if I am his sheep, he is my shepherd. Yeah. And scripture says in John 10 that my sheep hear my voice. I'm gonna hear the voice of God if I'm a sheep of that shepherd. Psalm 23 says his rod, the shepherd, his rod and his staff, they protect me. Therefore, I, face, I fear no evil, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I don't face evil. I don't face pain. I don't face hardship alone. I face it in the covering and protection of Christ. He is the good shepherd, and I have nothing to fear. But you've got to decide whether you want to be a sheep or a wolf. See, because the reality is, if you're drinking this, what side are you on? This doesn't sound like favor and blessing and kindness and grace and goodness. So you have to ask yourself, because many people call themselves Christians and still drink the haterade. Come on, say, shake it off. Number three, stay close to a battle buddy. Stay close to a battle buddy. Stay close. Anybody in here, like, I just, I, 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 ever been in the military? Can I see your hands? Anybody ever been? Okay. Can we just give it up for all those people? Like, they, for real, give it up for those people. 
That is not an easy job. Uh, I, I don't know how well I would do at it, uh, just to be honest. Like, like, so like the fact that you did that, like I am internally grateful and respectful and I honor that service. But one of the things you learn, learn about, the, like, like, like looking at the military, is they, they try to give you a battle buddy. They try to give you somebody that's going to be with you in the fight. Who's seen Forrest Gump? Yeah. Who's the battle buddy? Bubba. Bubba. We're going we're gonna to put our backs against each other so we don't have to put our heads in the mud. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's got a battle buddy. He's got somebody to do life with so that when things are tough, everybody's still thinking about somebody else, protecting somebody else, trying to help somebody else. Nobody fights the battle alone. Do you know that Jesus did not send you out as sheep among wolves by yourself? Unless you decide to go it alone. In fact, this is Mark chapter 6, verse 7. And he called the 12 disciples together and he began sending them out what? Two by two. Two by two. So it's like, okay, I'm going to send you behind enemy lines, but you're never going to go out there alone. You're always going to go out there with a battle buddy. Now, what happens to a sheep if it's by itself surrounded by wolves? It's going to get eaten. Why? Because what happens is this. Like wolves, their, their, their goal is to get just one away from the herd. And if they can get one away from the herd, they will devour it. Same is true for you spiritually, that if you don't have a battle buddy and you're behind enemy lines, you will be destroyed. But if you got somebody who's walking in faith with you, who's encouraging you, who's thinking mission-minded like you, how can we help as many people as we can cross the line of faith and follow Jesus? How are we going to face this battle? How are we going to honor Christ? How are we going to move forward? How are we going to patiently worship Jesus in the midst of attack? How, like, if you've got somebody like that in your world, oh my gosh, you can handle anything. I, I found this stat recently that was kind of fascinating to me. Um, like, there's this Australian megachurch with great music. <laughs> a lot of you probably know it, Hillsong. They, like the, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a stat that just came out from their pastor just recently. And he says this, that 93%, this is one of the biggest churches in the world, 93% of new people who attend their church are gone within one year if they do not plan to find a place to serve. Because they came for the show and they got a great buzz but a buzz always turns into a hangover. And God's goal for you is to turn a buzz into a blessing. That eventually the buzz will go to a blessing. How does it become a blessing? That you begin to interact with some other life, that you begin to encourage some other heart, that you begin to know somebody else's name, that you get down in the nitty gritty of their heart and their life, that you know their story, their situation. When they're going through tough stuff, you're texting them, you're praying over their life, you're encouraging them. You're not just here for a show, you're here to encourage somebody else. And what happens is those people stick it out. And by the way, by the way, some people are like, well, that's probably not the crossing. No, I, I think our stats are pretty similar. We celebrate hundreds of people that get baptized here every stinking year. New people and new people and new people. People cross the line of faith and getting baptized. Like literally a year later, I would say 85% of them, <laughs> gone. Because they never found a place to serve. Never found a place to connect. Some of you have been around here for years and then you go through something tough, nobody's helping you, and you're like, oh, I can't believe. That's because you never invested in anybody. Nobody knows you. So you are a sheep solo among wolves, and your faith gets destroyed. But if you would choose to invest in relationship, you choose to invest in serving, you choose to invest in some other heart and some other life, I would challenge some of you, don't leave here today. Until you actually got somebody else's name and somebody else's story, somebody else's phone number, somebody that you can interact with. That's not a way to hit on a girl, by the way. <laughs> but that's just some... <laughs> but I'm just throwing it out there because the reality is you're going to face some really big battles. And if you don't have somebody in your corner, it's going to be really hard to survive spiritually. Come on, say, so get a battle buddy. Get a battle buddy. That's how you shake... Like, it's easy to shake stuff off if you've got a battle buddy. Why? Because you're paying more attention to what they're saying than what the... Naysayers are saying. So when somebody at work is criticizing you, you're like, dude, I just need a little positive spoken over me. (laughs) 
Somebody at school is ripping on you. Hey, at least a little bit of positive spoken over me. And there's somebody who's like constantly speaking faith over you. And you're not just hearing it on a weekend service, but you're hearing it with a close personal relationship. That keeps you in the faith. And then lastly, have the courage to keep speaking life even if other people speak death. Have the courage to keep speaking life even if other people speak what? Speak death. Now, remember, we talked about, like Pastor Anthony talked about a little bit last week, that basically you're only two things coming out your mouth, life or death. That every time you speak, you are bringing life to a situation or you are bringing death to it. And many people bring death to a situation and they don't even realize they're bringing death to the situation. They're criticizing, they're complaining, they're, they're, they're whining, they're griping, and, and they don't realize, well, how come things are getting worse? Because you're spewing death. And it affects everything. Or you can speak life even if others speak death. Do you know what this makes you? Countercultural. See, because you've been taught, if somebody says something nasty about me, say something back. If somebody hits me, hit them back. That is not Jesus. What separates Christianity from every other major religion is the law of nonviolence. That Jesus Christ believes that you are brave enough. Come on, say, I'm brave enough. enough. That you're brave enough to bless when other people curse you. That you are brave enough to bless when other people curse That you're brave enough to turn the other cheek and leave judgment to God. That you're brave enough to forgive when other people hate. This is what separates you from average people. Why do we celebrate Martin Luther King? Law of nonviolence. Why do people celebrate Gandhi? Law of nonviolence. See, the reason why we celebrate some of these great men and women of the past isn't because they drank the haterade. It's because when somebody else drank haterade, they responded with blessing. And you have an option. You can continue the culture of hating other people and the cycle of violence continues. Or you can be brave enough to forgive and turn the other cheek and bless and be kind and be good and be like Jesus and change the world. It's entirely, come on, church, it's your choice. Now, some of you are like, why? Why would I even want to do that? And I would just give you Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ. What? The way I say it to myself, this is the Eric translation. Eric was a dumbass, and Jesus forgave him. (laughs) (laughs) Therefore, when somebody else treats me like a... (laughs) I will forgive them (laughs) because I was probably a bigger at some point and he forgave me. So I'm not going to respond in the negative just because somebody else does. This is always the way of the enemy. We will respond with integrity and honor and blessing and love and kindness. And we will speak faith to each other. And in the process of all that, we're just going to shake it off. This is how you live an honorable Christian life in a world surrounded by wolves. But you have to choose to say, I would rather be like Jesus than be like those that killed him. At the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Everybody else talking smack at him. Well, he's on the cross. There's only two sides. Every day, in every conversation, every time somebody flips you off in traffic, you have a chance. Every time somebody talks smack about you at school and you didn't do anything and they just twisted the truth and did the whole deal, you still have a responsibility to be like Christ if the world's gonna change for the better. Come on, say, shake it off. off. In a kind, honorable, forgiving way. And the world could possibly change. But it will never change if you keep hitting back, if you keep criticizing, if you keep up the same old, same old. Let me just pray for you for a second. Can you close your eyes and bow your head? 
I just want you to think about your life. Have you been forgiven? Jesus forgave you, but have you asked for it? Maybe like you're thinking about your last week or your last month, and you're like, dude, I jacked up some major stuff. Well, this is your chance to get forgiveness from God. In fact, what we're gonna do right now is I'm gonna give you a chance to just confess and ask forgiveness and say, God, I'm gonna choose to follow you. Jesus, I love you, and I thank you for your forgiveness. So that's something you know you need to pray right now. I just want you to say, Jesus Christ. Come on, say, Jesus Christ. This morning, I ask your forgiveness. I'm sorry sometimes I turn the wrong way and speak death instead of life. I thank you for your forgiveness. I thank you for your love. I thank you that you have a good plan and you're speaking life over me. Help me to be the one to speak life over others and speak death no more. Now just with your head bowed and eyes closed, I want you to, I have a second question and I'm gonna do this one by raising a hand. That was a good prayer. We're, confessing it, but here's the reality. I know some of you, like you're in some tough stuff and it's really hard to forgive when other people hate. So if right now you're thinking of a name or a face and they're really hard to forgive, can you just put your hand in the air? Put them up, put them up all over. Man, last night, same thing. There's so many hands, so many people going through so much stuff. All right, leave the hands up. I want you to leave your hands up. Today we are going to confess together and seek, and seek to forgive because we're gonna to need to do this over and over and over again if we're, gonna get, if we're gonna be able to forgive somebody else. So I want you to say, Jesus Christ, right now I release this person. I can forgive them. I believe you've given me the power to forgive and release them, to walk confident and bold in joy and not bitterness. I will move forward with my life I'm shaking it off, and from this moment on, I forgive because you forgave me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Now that's good, that's, that makes me happy.